Hey, it is 12 noon on Wednesday, which t means it's time for this week's episode of Ask the Instructor. I'm John Crismo. The show is brought to you by the Tampa School of Real Estate. We're talking today about the listing appointment, the math, the numbers you need to know behind it, and how you could help get your listing sold faster, get them your contract closed quicker, all these factors that play into the whole kind of process, how much your seller is able to walk away with. Definitely real world stuff you're going to need to know to be successful in the real estate industry. So stick with us. we got a great show for you today. You're watching Ask the Instructor. You are watching Ask the Instructor. After every Wednesday at 12 noon Eastern Time, I'm John Crismo. Oh, you're watching Ask the Instructor. Hey, welcome to this week's episode of Ask the Instructor. See what uh, Tropical Storm Elemily has been doing to my hair. It's all over the place today. I don't know what's going on with that. Hopefully it doesn't distract too much from the, uh, the show. I know it's going to distract me this whole time. <laughs> Anyways, what we're talking about today is listings. But before we get into that, before we get into solving any of this stuff, let's talk about why we're here every Wednesday, 12 noon Eastern time. We come to you to help you grow, develop, mastermind, learn the technical stuff that, that today we're going to go a lot deeper than what you learn in the pre-licensing course. We're gonna have a lot of topics that you'll probably remember from the pre-licensing course if you already took the course with us, but we're gonna go a level deeper and talk a little bit more about the real world applications of this information. A lot of stuff that I wanna to cover today. Number one is the, the price psychology. Getting the property priced at the right amount so that way you don't, number one, have it sitting on the market forever. Number two, you don't look like you know what you're, not don't know what you're doing. And number three, your clients are ultimately happier with you. And that all comes down to getting the price right to begin with. And we'll explain that in just a little bit. Um, only the seller is able to walk away from based on that price it is that you came up with. Now, all of a sudden, you're, you're able to get a better picture because with the seller, they might say they want to sell a house for $300,000. But what does that really mean to them? How much money are they walking away with? Would they be okay selling it for $270,000 if they get the money that they need to walk away with? Do the stream, send something, say just a hello, maybe where you're watching from. But let's go on, the show must go on. So market value. The definition of market value is really simplified. There's a big long definition from Fannie Mae of what they determine market value to be. But ultimately what it boils down to is most probable price. Most probable price. So most probable price, that, that's what you want to think of when you're trying to establish the market value of a property. And this is how much you think the property is going to sell for in normal circumstances. And what we're going to be talking about is how to price this right and get it sold quickly because that's ultimately what we want. Yes, the, the buyer or seller might want to have some qualms about the price, but ultimately we want to try to get that property moved through as quickly as possible. The seller sells it quickly, and part of that comes in with the assumption of establishing the correct market value. Now, there might be, there, there's, a, there's no might be about it, there's lots of sellers out there who want to sell their property for higher than market value. And that's fine for them to want to do that, but if they realistically want to get their property sold, they're going to ultimately be disappointed in the long run. Yeah, I mean, you maybe see like these make me move things that show up on Zillow where they're like, oh, make me move for this price or whatever that may be. And the price might be completely astronomical compared to what the feasible market value of the property may be. Now, in the Tampa Bay area, as well as a lot of areas throughout Florida and uh, little pockets all over the country, we're in a seller's market right now. And in the seller's market, it means it's advantageous to the seller. But don't let that go to your seller's head. Because just because we're in a seller's market doesn't mean you could sell your property for double of what market value is. No, it just means that you could sell it for market value. It's just you should have it under contract in less than 30 days in a seller's market at the right price. Now, breaking down the pricing for this here to help you understand the market value a little bit and really just understanding price in general of the property. So I'm going to lay out this little uh, chart here. So we've got on this side, day zero. And on this side, let's say day 180. 
So we've got day zero and day 180. And over here on this side, we've got zero people seeing at this versus, uh, let's see, how can I draw on the eyeballs here? Let's just put lots of eyeballs because I can't even imagine how I'm going to draw eyeballs. I'm not an artist. I was not gifted uh, with the gift of drawing. I have a hard enough time making my text legible here. So we've got lots of eyeballs up here. Lots of people seeing the property versus nobody seeing the property. And what happens when you list a property? When you initially list a property, when you've got a, a just listed, a brand new listing, you're going to be here. You're going to have a ton of attention on the property. And that's when you're going to have the most attention on the property because this is basically what's going to occur. As And really, it's actually probably more so a little bit more logarithmic where it's like that, where that drops off very quickly. You've got all this great initial attention and then that starts to drop off. Now, you might say, well, can't we just do a price reduction? Because yeah, you get notifications when there's a price reduction. So let's have this additional line here for a price reduction. So let's say here we are, we've got all this initial traffic. Okay, we haven't sold it yet. We're at day 30, let's do a price reduction. So boom, a little bit of a kick for price reduction and then it drops back down again. So if you do do a price decrease, a price reduction, yeah, that should kind of you know give you a little bit of a bump. But ultimately, you're nowhere going to be near that initial just listed amount of eyeballs, the amount of people looking at that property. And your job as a listing agent, your sole purpose is to maximize this number, the people looking at the property. That's your number one responsibility, getting the most people seeing the property. And yeah, you open it up to tons, uh, probably the largest amount of, of potential buyers just by putting it in the MLS because that's going to syndicate out to Zillow, to homes.com, to realtor.com, to every agent that, that's in the MLS, to every client that agent has subscribed to auto emails. That's why you're getting so much traffic initially on a listing is right off the bat you get the most eyeballs. So you get these most eyeballs right here. Let's say we've got the property overpriced to begin with. Let's say the market value on this property is 375,000 and your client is like, no, uh, 375,000, that's way too low. We've got to do at least 400,000. So you list it at 400,000 knowing it's overpriced. All these eyeballs that are seeing at the beginning with when you're see getting the most amount of people, they're looking at it and they're like, yeah, you know, it, it's nice, but you know, it, it seems to be a little bit too expensive. Maybe the more even drastic overpricing than just the extra $25,000. It could be much more than that that is overpriced. But what you're doing there is you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot with this initially because you're getting the most eyeballs here. So when you price it accordingly to begin with, when you can establish market value right from the get-go, when you've got market value right from the get-go, that's going to really make your job a, a, a lot easier because in a seller's market like we're in today, if you've established the appropriate market value within about two weeks, within the first two weeks, you should have an offer on the property. It might not be a perfect offer, but you should have at least gotten a offer on the property. If you haven't gotten an offer in the first two weeks, that means your property's overpriced. How much it's overpriced? There's rules of thumb. Some people say, oh, it's 10% overpriced. If you have this property listed and you're not getting any showings, not even any showings within the first two weeks that people don't even want to see the price because they look at the pictures. Maybe you did a bad taking the pictures and then they see it and then they don't want to make an offer. But ultimately it boils down to the price because at the right price, any property will sell. A slum with the ceiling falling out and the foundation caving in and all these problems with termites and, and rats and mold and, and asbestos and lesbates paint and, and all these things. You can have all these things wrong with the property. It will still sell. I could promise you that, but it's not going to sell for the same price as a home in immaculate condition. So any property can sell, but it's at the right price. So it, it's your job to help establish that right price to begin with here. And when you, you set this right price here, you're opening up to the most amount of eyeballs because here, like we said, we could do a price reduction. So two weeks goes by, 30 days goes by, so whatever time goes by and we finally convince the seller, hey, look, there's no way we're going to sell it at that initial price we came up with. Let's do a price reduction. We'll get, we'll peak the interest a little bit, but you probably could have sold it if you listed it right off the bat at that initial price. 
Whereas here, you might still be selling it less than that. And what happens when you price it accordingly to begin with, when you can start getting offers on the property? Yes, the, the price of rubber to begin with, it, it's usually gonna be lower than what people's expectations are. So it's probably gonna be lower than their expectations in most cases. Sometimes it's higher. <laughs> That's a little bit more rare for that to occur. But when you price that right to begin with, you've got way more eyeballs than you're going to have even just doing a price reduction. And the problem is you're going to have that mindset shift. Now with the price reduction, anytime you see a property, one of the key numbers to look at is days on market. So you'll see this as DOM and it's either ADOM or CDOM, but basically the DOM stands for days on market. You could look at either one of those two. One of them's gonna be longer than the other uh, all the time, but you could just look at the DOM, uh, either one of them. The longer, the higher this number is, and this is, this is when buyer's agents see this because a buyer may ask their agent, how long has the property been on the market for? And, and they might see that and say, oh, it's been on the market for 60 days. Well, what's wrong with it? Maybe you didn't do any price reductions. And, they, and their, their first reaction over here, when the property's just listed, especially in a seller's market, when it's just listed, they're gonna say, wow, look at this property. It's a beautiful property. Do we wanna buy it? That's the first thing that they're thinking through their head. Do we wanna put an offer on it before anybody else does? That's what they're thinking when there's this just listed mentality. When it's brand new on the market, that's where you can kind of, you have a bit of an advantage there because a lot of people are gonna be asking, oh, do we wanna buy this? Do we wanna put an offer on it? Whereas the higher this number goes, the more our days on market goes up, even if we do a price reduction, and especially if we do a price reduction, the buyer's gonna be saying, oh, it's been on the market for 30 days, it's been on the market for 60 days, they reduced the price, well, what's wrong with it? I don't wanna have to deal with inspections and all that other stuff, and, and you could be the greatest agent in the world telling them, yeah, we'll just have it inspected, we could get some maybe uh, additional money off of that if there's some problems that we find, or we could just back out of the contract, whatever it is you wanna do, but now all of a sudden, it, 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 it's, we're looking at this and we're, we're saying, yeah, do we really wanna buy this property? Is it really worth what it is? So here we're asking, Oh, do we want to buy this property? Here we're asking, what's wrong with the property? Why hasn't it sold yet? Especially in a seller's market. In a buyer's market, it's not as much of a problem with this year. Because in a buyer's market, it's just, oh, it's a buyer's market. There's tons of sellers out there. There's no buyers. That's why it's still on the market. And five, six, seven years ago, that's what you saw in the Tampa Bay area. But it slowly shifted to now where if a property is on the market for more than 30 days, you're looking at it and you're saying, okay, what's wrong with this property? or how overpriced is the property? Those are the two things, because if A, there's nothing wrong with the property, it's B, how overpriced is it? And what's that lowest price they're gonna accept? Whereas here, it's the reverse mentality. It's like, oh, it's just on the market. It looks like it's a good deal. It looks like it's worth what they're asking for. Now, how quick can we make an offer on it so nobody else can make an offer on it and we don't end up in a bidding war? So when you're in this initial stage here, this initial period, these first two weeks, that's the best time to really maximize the, the, the price of the property. So you want to price it right to begin with. We're going to talk about how to do that and what to look at, what particulars you need to find, how to, to really come up with that accurate price and not just relying on these estimates. Hopefully you're not relying on a estimate as a, as a real estate professional. When you're a realtor, you've got the access to the MLS. There's a lot better system in there called Realist and depending on your local board, they might use something different, but they usually have a system that's a lot more accurate than that. But even then, it's relying on public record information and isn't always 100% accurate. So that's where your expertise comes in as a professional to establish that right price to begin with. We're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about Seller's Net and a lot more about listing appointments. Stick with us. I'm John Chrisma. You're watching Ask the Instructor. Have you been thinking about starting a career in real estate? Enjoy an entrepreneurial lifestyle that allows for schedule flexibility with unlimited income potential. In real estate, the sky is the limit and what you put in is what you get out. Learn more about a career in real estate at tampaschool.com. Did you know that if post-licensing education isn't completed by your first renewal, your real estate license will become null and void? If your license becomes null and void, you must restart the licensing process all over again. At the Tampa School of Real Estate, we make renewal requirements easy. Visit postflorida.com to learn more and enroll today. 
you want to incorporate studying for your real estate exams into your busy schedule? Now you can review the key topics you need to know to pass your class and state exams with our MP3 audio review. Simply pop in your headphones or connect to your car to reinforce crucial information while you exercise or drive. Listen to the first unit for free at mp3audioreview.com. That's mp3audioreview.com. Does your current career allow for unlimited income potential? With a career in real estate, the sky is the limit. What you put in is what you get out. Find out more about how you can tap into the unlimited income potential of a career in real estate at tampaschool.com. Hey, if you're enjoying the show today, which I'm sure you are, be sure to hit like, subscribe, post your comments, share with your friends and family. Thank you guys so much for watching. You are watching Ask the Instructor. After every Wednesday at 12 noon Eastern Time, I'm John Carismo. Oh, you're watching Ask the Instructor. Hey, welcome back to this week's episode of Ask the Instructor. I'm John Crismo. The show is brought to you by the Tampa School of Real Estate. You can find out more information below, tampaschool.com. Give us a call, 813-928-0106, or check out our recommended strategy to pass your exams on the first try at passfirsttry.com. And what we're here doing today, every Wednesday, 12 noon Eastern time, it's called Ask the Instructor. I'm John Crismo on behalf of the Tampa School of Real Estate, coming to your homes, your phones, your tablets, whatever it is you're watching us on, to help you understand some of these more technical points of the real estate industry. And today, we're talking about something that you absolutely want to master. Last week on Friday, on our episode of State of Real Estate, we were kind of contemplating the buyers and sellers. And ultimately, sellers are what's going to who you want to seek out. We establish there's no bad type of client. Buyers aren't bad, sellers aren't bad, any client that you could work with are good. And unless you could turn away business, which you shouldn't be doing anyways, there's, uh, you should build a team around you, grow it bigger, and so on and so forth. But when you're seeking out clients, you definitely want to seek out sellers more so than buyers. Again, depends on your market, depends on some other factors. Go watch, back and watch State of Real Estate Buyers versus Sellers uh, and you get more info uh, on that whole process. We spent a whole hour diving into that, how you can generate referral business and new business from that. But with the sellers, when you've got inventory, when you've got product, you absolutely will fare better than buyers where you're just relying on referrals. Whereas with a, a property you have listed for sale, you have people calling you up wanting to buy a property. Maybe not that one specifically, that's the one they're interested in. They may end up buying something else, but guess what? They're now talking to you. And if they're talking to you, they probably don't have a realtor. They probably don't have any professional representing them if they're just out there calling signs. And if they do, they don't have a good enough relationship with their, their realtor where they have any sort of loyalty to them. So good stuff to, to know there. But now this is kind of the part two of that. We talk about the reason why this is important. And I just want a quick shout out to everyone that's tuning in and watching. Uh, thanks for tuning in, Tina, uh, Nama, Georgia, Liz, Mariana, everyone. Uh, if you guys haven't gone to YouTube already, go on YouTube, subscribe to us, just search for Tampa School of Real Estate. We've got over 80,000 views on our videos on there, over 80,000 views. The, the YouTube channel is going crazy right now, so make sure you're in there and you're subscribed so that way you get email notifications of whenever it is that we're live. So, we're talking about why it's important to price the property right to begin with. Why? You need to get this right price to begin with because again, that's when you're going to have the most eyeballs. This line here is the amount of eyeballs that you have. And as we creep up on the end of this here, it's going lower and lower and lower. And that mindset starts shifting from, do we want to buy this property to what's wrong with this property, how overpriced it is. So you want to price it right to begin with. And this is very important to explain to your seller because your seller, they don't know this. There, there's probably some of you real estate professionals out there that are tuning into this that, that don't necessarily understand this. I can tell you there, there's a lot of realtors out there that don't understand this. That you get the most visuals, the most eyeballs, the most traffic on your property when it's first listed. That's important. That's essential to know and it's essential to convey that information to your seller. To let them know, hey, when we first list the property, that's when we're going to have the most attention on it. That's when we have our best opportunity to start a bidding war. If we go past two weeks and we don't have a contract on the property, we're not getting a bidding war. We're going to be lucky if we sell the property at that point because we're going to have 
decreasing eyeball. So we're going to talk about how to price that property right for, to begin with uh, and what you want to look at. And yeah, it's a good basis. It's a good reference point to go look at these automated valuation models, whether it's the realist system or whatever system it is that you're using in there. But ultimately, you want to look at that neighborhood and you want to look at the activity that's been going on in that neighborhood. And that's how you're able to make your professional opinion. So the number one thing you want to look at are the solds. That's sod sold. So the properties that have sold, this is your number one. And this is reality. So our solds, that represents what's real. What could really happen when we want to sell the property? What properties in that neighborhood are really selling for? Now, if the properties are significantly different, that's where you have to kind of adjust off of this here. You might have to sell it for a little bit lower, or you might be able to sell it higher, depending on how this reference is to the neighborhood. But that's your reality. This is, this is what's most likely to influence your property. But that's not the only information you want to look at. When you're trying to establish the value, this is what you look at first and you probably base your, your numbers off of, but you want to take into account what else is out there. And the second one you want to look at are the greens. These are your active property. And this represents your competition. So it's number two you want to look at. Number one, you want to look at the sold prices. That's the reality of what the properties are, are, are selling for in this area. Number two, you want to look at the competition, and that's your active listings. Active listings are properties that are out there that are trying to sell, that are trying to sell. So th these are the properties you're competing with, and that's where you want to remember that principle of substitution that says if there's another home just like your property, for sale for let's say $500,000, your home really can't sell for more than $500,000 if that property is very similar to yours. So that competition is definitely something you wanna take into account because if there's another home just like the property you're trying to sell, that's the pretty much what you're competing with, that price. And unless there's something that makes it significantly different, maybe this property has a swimming pool, whereas that one doesn't, not going to be a huge value add. That's probably one of the bigger ones, but you know, maybe an extra fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 that you could tack onto the value because it has that swimming pool. Doesn't matter how much they paid for the swimming pool. It's probably only going to be about fifteen dollars to maybe $25,000, depending on how much that property is really worth that it's adding to the value of the property there. But it's things like that that you're looking at when you're making these adjustments when you're either going up or down. Next one we want to look at. This is number three. This is most. Uh, this is also a very important one. These three are the ones that are going to be the most telling, and that's your expireds. An expired listing is like the kiss of death. That means you've gone through that cycle of a listing, the three months, the six months, the one year, the, the nine months, however long the property was listed for. It spent that whole time on the market and it didn't sell. That, that's bad news. So, so these, these are our, our fantasy land. So the expired listings, and this is basically what we're going off of the price here. We've got the reality, what we're probably going to be able to sell the property for. This is our best indicator of market value. Then we've got to look at our competition to see, okay, what else is really out there that's selling? What are we competing with currently? And then last one we're looking at is the expireds, which, hey, these are the people that try to sell the property for more than it's worth. They could live in dream world, they could live in the fantasy world, but they're gonna end up with an expired listing. Now there's other types of ones that you wanna look at as well, really one other one mainly, um, actually two other types, uh, and I don't have the appropriate colors for what these are here, but typically you'll have uh, what's called a pending. And that what I would say would be number four to look at is your pendings. These are typically orange, depending on your MLS, but usually like a yellowy orange type of thing. And the pendings, these don't give you too much information because this doesn't tell you what the property is under contract for. And especially if other people interested in buying that property that might be pending, especially if they're taking backup offers, it would not behoove them to tell you what the contract is for. So the pendings don't give you a whole lot of information. It does tell you, yes, this property is under contract currently, but it hasn't closed. So it's still good to look at, but it's not one of the top three here. And the other one you want to look at is also the withdrawns. So 
So with our withdrawn listings, and these ones usually show up as like a, a gray color depending on your MLS, uh, but with the withdrawns, similar to expired. Now, it doesn't always mean that the property couldn't sell. Maybe it's just that the, the seller changed their mind and decided they don't want to sell, whether it's because they couldn't sell it for how much they thought they're going to sell it, or maybe the agent's just trying to save face by withdrawing it before it goes expired. So either way, the, 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 these two in the blue here don't give you a whole lot of information here. They, they, they're, they are helpful to look at but they're not the top three. The top three you want to look at is the solds. Again, that's your reality. The active, that's what you're competing with. And then the last one is expireds. And again, that's going to be the, the fantasy land, the ones that people tried to sell them. But, and again, it all comes down to price. You could say, you could make up excuses for why it didn't sell saying, oh, well, it didn't sell because, you know, we found out the property had lead-based paint and no one wanted to buy it. No, people still wanted to buy it. They just didn't want to buy it for the price that you're selling it for. Because any property will sell. Again, it could be the worst property in the worst condition in the world and you'll still be able to sell it. But again, it's based on the price because they're not gonna pay full price for a property that needs rehab, that needs work, that, that isn't in peak top condition and full retail value. So again, it, it's all based on the price for that. And you wanna use this information to establish the market value to begin with. So you, and the number one, again, to look at is the souls. You look at what's sold in the neighborhood because that's going to tell you and what's really, and you want to dive into the details of each one of these here. You want to look at the days on the market. That's very important, especially with the souls because the higher the days on the market, that tells you the longer it was that it took to take to sell the property. So you want this number to be lower. The lower that number is, the more we're dealing with in reality here. The higher that number is, you might also see where, because the MLS will actually show you if there's been decreases in the property. So, so was there price changes? So you want to look at that. Okay, where are there price changes in the property? You want to look at other things as well. You want to look at how comparable it is. I mean, that's one of the first things you're looking at is, okay, does it match the bedrooms, the bathrooms, the, the look and feel of it? Look through the pictures. See what condition the property is in. Is it a cluttered property? Because if it's a cluttered property and the property that you're trying to figure out the market value for is very neat and clean, that means you could probably kick up the price a little bit. Did it have great curb appeal? If it's got greater curb appeal and your property doesn't have great curb appeal, we're going to have to discount our property a little bit because that one looked more appealing. And, and you, a lot of agents underestimate that, that first look at the property, that first initial picture. That's so crucial because, and in the MLS, it requires the first picture to be the exterior of the home. So if the property doesn't have the curb appeal, people sometimes click through that without even clicking and seeing the additional photos of that property they might eliminate that property just because of a bad first image. So you want to look at the, the quality of the marketing on the property. Look at those pictures it is they took. In the digital world that we live in today, we have a fewer and fewer, a smaller percentage of people actually looking at the homes because they're looking online and they're eliminating a lot of options online before they go see them in person because their time is valuable and they don't want to waste their time going to a property that they know they're not going to like. And if there's bad pictures, bad photos about the property, that's definitely something that's going to hurt this price. But again, this is the number one thing it is you're going to look at. And you, again, you want to use these same factors for the actives. Okay, how long has our competition been on the market for? When was that listed? Have they done any price reductions? The expireds, did they do price reductions? How long was it on the market before it expired? So again, these are three key telling pieces of information that you need to look at. We're gonna take another quick commercial break here, but when we come back, we're gonna talk more about listings, more about the stuff you need to know um, to, to really kind of help your seller understand. We're gonna be talking about seller's net to see how much cash it is they're able to walk away with, which that's ultimately the more important number than what the property is sold for. So stay with us. I'm John Christmo. You're watching Ask the Instructor. Have you been thinking about starting a career in real estate? Enjoy an entrepreneurial lifestyle that allows for schedule flexibility with unlimited income potential. In real estate, the sky is the limit, and what you put in is what you get out. Learn more about a career in real estate at tampaschool.com. Did you know that if post-licensing education isn't completed by your first renewal, your real estate license will become null and void? If your license becomes null and void, you must restart the licensing process all over again. At the Tampa School of Real Estate, we make renewal requirements easy. Visit postflorida.com to learn more and enroll today. 
you want to incorporate studying for your real estate exams into your busy schedule? Now you can review the key topics you need to know to pass your class and state exams with our MP3 audio review. Simply pop in your headphones or connect to your car to reinforce crucial information while you exercise or drive. Listen to the first unit for free at mp3audioreview.com. That's mp3audioreview.com. Does your current career allow for unlimited income potential? With a career in real estate, the sky is the limit. What you put in is what you get out. Find out more about how you can tap into the unlimited income potential of a career in real estate at tampaschool.com. Hey, if you're enjoying the show today, which I'm sure you are, be sure to hit like, subscribe, post your comments, share with your friends and family. Thank you guys so much for watching. You are watching Ask the Instructor. After every Wednesday at 12 noon Eastern Time. I'm John Carismo. Oh, you're watching Ask the Instructor. Hey, welcome back to this week's episode of Ask the Instructor. While we're on break there, I was going through the comments. Uh, so we've got a great question coming in from, forgive me if I pronounce this wrong, Jatinder Bon. So Jatinder Bon, um, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching. Um, great question he asked. What if we don't have any sold in the neighborhood? What if we don't have any sold? Again, that's your number one piece of data. And before we go any further, I definitely wanna clear this up because this is a problem you run into more often than not. And going back to kind of the specific of his question, in the same neighborhood, your ideal is to look within that neighborhood within that specific neighborhood. Now, in suburban areas like the, the New Tampa area, like where our uh, headquarters is for uh, Tampa School of Real Estate, there's a lot of pocketed neighborhoods, a lot of subdivisions that are very closed off, that are gated. Those are very easy if you have recent sales in the neighborhood, if you've got solds in the neighborhood. And especially if you're in an area like Tampa, it's likely you will find solds, but there's gonna be occasions when you're in these neighborhoods and there's no solds. And, and also when you're in a urban area, like maybe more so like South Tampa or these more urban markets where it's a, it's a bunch of blocks and they're not really kind of sectioned off into neighborhoods so much, they kind of all bleed into each other. And in that type of scenario, it really requires expert uh, expertise of a professional because you really got to know the lay of the land there and where the the good neighborhood is where, where the where, where it starts to change the value on that that's where the computer gets harder at predicting that stuff but either way when you're in this specific neighborhood that is of similar homes and there's not sold again that's the number one thing you want to look at and if there's not sold that's telling you a couple of different things so the number one is that and this is so if you don't see solds you want to err on the side of pushing down the value more because if there's not solds that means there's not people buying in that neighborhood it sounds obvious but let's think of what that means there's not people buying in that neighborhood and that's where you want to look at are there actives are there expired so if there's actives and expires, but there's no solds, that's a major red flag. Now, you go back far enough, you should be able to find a sold listing. You usually don't want to go back further than six months, ideally, when you're looking at uh, comparable properties. If you go back further than six months, yes, there's market changes, and you could correct for that in the percentages, but the more corrections you have to do, the more likely you're going to end up with an incorrect market value, either being too high or too low. Uh, so you could go back further in time. That's one option if you want to try to look at some of the solds. But again, I want to reiterate that fact. When you don't see solds, that's where you want to err on the going lower in the value because that means people aren't buying. Whether it's because people don't want to live there, maybe people are moving away from there, whatever the reason may be that there's, there's one thing going on when you don't see solds and that's people aren't buying. And if there's no actives and no expireds, that means there's no properties for sale. So in that case, you know, it, it is very unpredictable but then you, you might be okay with the value as you come up with. But when there are actives and there are expires, but there's no solds, that's where you're like, okay, we've got to go down a little bit lower because obviously people don't want to buy here. People don't want to live here. For, there's some reason, something pushing that into it. And, it, and that's, a, that's a tough conversation to have with your seller when, when they're, they're, you have to tell them basically people don't want to live here. Obviously, they don't want to live there. That's why they're selling. So, um, but yeah, when there's not solds, that's when you got to be like, okay, we've, we've got to go lower in the price because people don't want to be in this neighborhood. 
but ultimately for trying to find the value uh, again look at the actives look at the expired you got to be lower than your competition definitely way lower than the fantasy land of the expireds so that's for really kind of coming up the value again try to stay close to your property ideally within the same neighborhood within the last six months if you want to try to find some solds out there to see some of this information the days on market the price changes things like that that's where you can go further back in time which that's probably better than expanding outside the neighborhood because you start getting outside the neighborhood that's where it's a lot harder to really quantify those changes. Whereas the changes over time, that's definitely uh, where you could just apply some simple math of if it went up 5%, okay, that means we just gotta increase this sale price by 5% over that period of time. So easier to correct for the, the time rather than correcting for the location in the neighborhood. So try to stay within that same neighborhood when you're coming up with these values. And that's for basically coming up with this listing price. Now. This is stuff that you want to have done ahead of time. Yes, you do have to see the property to know for sure of, because you're probably going to end up with some sort of range. Okay, maybe on the low end, let's say the low end is 350, the high end is 400. And based on the condition, the state of that property, how good it's going to show, uh, and how quickly those listings are, are selling, you might be able to be more towards the 400 or more towards the 350. Now, when in doubt, I would probably always go with the lower number. And as long as the seller's okay with that, ultimately it's the seller's decision. You can't tell the seller we're selling it for this price and they have to listen to you. I mean, if they don't want to listen to you, they'll go hire somebody else or, or they're, they'll, uh, they won't list with you. So ultimately it is up to them, but you don't want to take an overpriced listing. You don't want to take an overpriced listing. And there, there's, there's brokers out there that'll say, oh, just take an overpriced listing. Lots of people that say, oh, any listing is better than no listings. And I understand where it is that they're coming from, but let's talk about that impression and, and that, that message it is that you're sending out to clients when you have a property that's been on the market for six months that you haven't been able to sell. Notice how I worded that, that you haven't been able to sell. Because they're gonna look at you and they'll say, well, this is a great property, it seems like a fair price. Some people will say that even if it's not a great property, it's not a fair price. And they might say, what's wrong with this agent? Why can't this agent sell the property? And it makes it look bad on you. If you're able to market the property effectively, the key thing here is making sure you've got some, some good pictures of it. Hire a professional photographer if you have to. Um, and if you can't afford that, maybe go take some camera lessons, but you're probably better off hiring a professional photographer for your time and your money and so on and so forth. But ultimately the price is the major factor in, in all of this stuff here. So. That's what we're going to come up with. Now, ultimately, we need to figure out how much the seller can walk away with. Because ultimately, how much cash, how much money the seller's getting is going to be much more important than how much they sell the property for. They could sell the property for a million dollars, but if they walk away with zero dollars, is that worth the seller's time, money, and effort of selling the property? Probably not. So the price becomes irrelevant to the seller, at least. The price impacts the buyer more than it impacts the seller. The cash at closing, how much the seller is able to walk away with their net. That's the term for this year, net. It's after all the expenses, how much money the seller is able to walk away with. That's ultimately going to be what's most important to the seller. To the buyer, again, that's the price. Or who knows, maybe it's the financing. Maybe it's just that the property is the most important to the seller. But the price isn't the most important to the seller. It's the seller's net that's most important to them. And a lot of the, the sellers have no idea how much money they're going to be able to walk away with. They just have some sort of number in their head. Now, where this becomes more difficult is where you're close to the loan amount. So let's say the loan is $400,000. The loan is $400,000. The property is maybe worth $400,000. They're not gonna be able to walk away no money out of pocket because they're gonna have to pay a commission. They're gonna have to pay closing costs. They might have to pay for some other things, maybe something to get the property ready to be sold. When the property, it, when the loan amount and the value are equivalent with each other, that's where you're gonna run into a situation where you're basically looking at doing a short sale. That might not be something the seller wants to do. That might be something that you don't wanna do because that's a much more complex sale because now you're, you're basically going off of the bank and what they want to take the property for because you're going to be shorting the bank on the sale of this property and the seller might be having to pay money out of pocket with this here so that might be a situation they might not be willing to entertain so 
that's where you're in difficult situations. Now, hopefully you're not in that situation. And for the most part, the markets have recovered where you're seeing short sales much fewer than what we saw before, where, where typically the prices are here and the loan amounts are, are here for the most part. That does, that's not always true, but you're seeing that more often now as opposed to the short sales. You used to see those more often back when we were in more kind of hectic times. Now, for figuring out the seller's net, Ultimately, there's a few things that you want to figure here. And this is going to be number one, the listing price. And we're going to actually work this in reverse. So don't, this isn't necessarily going to be number one where we're trying to come up with this here. Or really the sale price is what we're going to be looking at ultimately. So your listing price minus your payday, the commission. Not just your payday, but the other agents, the other brokerage, the cooperating brokerage that's involved. So both of that is paid out of the seller. Then we also have closing cost. And then we also have, and this is the big one, the loan payoff. This one's almost always the largest amount. Now, before you go on a listing appointment, you want to try to clarify with the seller of what their loan payoff may be. If they're unsure on what that loan payoff is, they just have to find one of their last statements from their mortgage and it should have in there in some way, shape or form, the loan payoff, how much money it is they still have due. And when you basically subtract all this stuff out, you're gonna end up with the seller's net. Now what happens typically is the seller will maybe have some number in mind that they wanna walk away from with the property. Maybe they don't, but if they do, or if we're trying to figure out how much they're able to walk away with, or what that minimum listing price, that minimum selling price that we need, we could actually reverse engineer this. So we could take the dollar amount that the seller wants to walk away with, and we'll just pick up some easy numbers here. Let's say that the seller wants to net $100,000. The seller wants to be able to have in their pocket at closing $100,000 put this in uh, some different colors here. So what's gonna eat away at that $100,000, the big one again is probably gonna be your, your loan payoff. Let's say they still owe $150,000 on their loan. Now instead of subtracting, going down, we're gonna flip it and reverse it, we're going in reverse, so we're flipping the signs, we're gonna add. So we're gonna take that $100,000 they wanna walk away with, add in the loan payoff. So let's say the loan payoff is $150,000. We already know before we pay closing cost and commission, we're looking at a minimum of $250,000 that we need to sell this property for. Then we also have to factor in closing costs. That's going to be depending on the listing price, but let's use a conservative number here. Let's say it's maybe $10,000. We get adjust accordingly. This is a whole kind of work in progress when we come up with this here. There's a ton of calculators online or better yet, talk to your title company. They might have their own calculator online, but that's usually going to give you a little bit more accurate number. And it's always better to overestimate this rather than underestimate this because if you tell them, they're going to walk away with $100,000. If you give them more than $100,000, are they going to be mad at you? <laughs> probably not. If you give them more money to walk away with than what they expected, they'll probably be happy. But if you take away that money, if you give them less money, that's where they might be a little frustrated with you. Probably more than a little frustrated with you. So always overestimate your closing cost. Now the commission, I'm going to show you guys how to calculate out the commission once we figured out this net amount here. But let's just use a, a roundabout number here of let's say maybe $20,000 is going to be the commission. Who knows, we might need to adjust this based on the price and based on the, the percentage it is that we want to charge. And this is why you want to do this math ahead of time here and understand what that minimum listing price may be. And then when we add that all up again, working backwards, we've got 100,000 they want to net, 150,000 that they need to pay off their mortgage, so we're at 250. We've got another 10,000 in closing costs, that's 260, and another $20,000 in commission, that ends up being $280,000. So $280,000 ends up being the the minimum really sale price when you reverse engineer this. So if they want to walk away with that $100,000 in order to pay off the loan, pay the closing costs, pay commission, they're going to need to sell it for at least $280,000. And you want to keep in mind with this as well, just because you list it for $280,000 doesn't necessarily mean it's going to sell for $280,000. People are going to want to negotiate. Even if it's already a fair price, it's a, if, even if it's a fair market value, they may want to negotiate. Unless they absolutely love the property, that's maybe the only time they come in with a full price offer. 
So they might be willing to negotiate or, or worst case scenario, you end up getting more money for your seller's net. So give yourself a little bit of a buffer here so that way the seller's net, if anything, is just gonna be higher than what they expect. So you know, maybe we list this at 289 and you know, throw a 900 in there for whatever reason because we want that extra $900. These numbers are made up for the most part. And, and this is gonna be something, again, that people are gonna negotiate off of. And they might say, okay, let's do, will you do 280? And between you and your conversations with the sellers, conversations with the sellers, that would go, okay, 280, that would get you the 100,000 it is that you wanted here. I think that's a good offer. Do you wanna take it? Or maybe, okay, we could counter back maybe get a little bit above that, keep a little bit more buffer in there. But again, when you have this price, this, this minimum sale price established ahead of time, that really helps out and makes the negotiations a lot easier because you could say, no, no, that, that's not quite there yet. We could do 285. How does that sound? Or maybe they offer 270 and you say, no, that, that, that won't really work. What about uh, 280? And if you come to the deal there and they say, oh no, we can't do 280, that's still too high, we'll, that, that's, uh, the, the seller won't go any lower. Or it makes sure you're not breaching any limited confidentiality with any of this stuff here. But you can see how having that minimum sale price is super important because now that makes, the, this establishes this ahead of time. And again, this would be protected under limited confidentiality. Even as a transaction broker, you wouldn't be able to advertise that number. And it's very important to tell your seller, hey look, I'm not gonna advertise this number unless you guys give me written permission to advertise that number. We'll pick this listing price here, and between us, we'll know that if we're over $280,000, that's where we need to be, because that's gonna get you your $100,000 you wanna walk away with. So, again, why you wanna do this math ahead of time is to see if it's feasible. To see if it's feasible to get them that $100,000 net. Because let's say this payoff was actually $250,000, and market value is around $300,000. If we just tacked on another 100,000 to this, and if they want to walk away with 100,000, that means we'd have to sell this for almost $400,000, which is completely unreasonable if we want to get the property sold. <laughs> because the market value is again, maybe around that $300,000. So you do this math ahead of time. You come up with these numbers, you use your calculators, you'll have to do maybe some trial and error to figure this out. But ultimately you're able to go in there knowing whether or not it's feasible to get them that seller's net. And now all of a sudden that's the number they're going to be more concerned with as opposed to the sale price. Because this number is going to fluctuate based on the sale. The closing costs are going to fluctuate based on the sale price. The loan payoff, that one's pretty much going to stay the same unless they're, it's, they're continuously making payments. Then that'll slowly decrease over the time as well and continue adding to the seller's net. But we don't want to have the property listed for too long. That's ultimately bad for us, bad for the client, and bad overall for all parties involved. Except for the, maybe the buyer. The buyer benefits from the property being listed for a while because now they, they've got the little bit of an upper hand. So... I'm gonna walk through one last calculation and that's gonna be how to figure what commission it is that you could charge because the commission is based on the, the sale price, not necessarily this arbitrary number that we just came up here to work with. That number, and off the top of my head, that sounds right, but I have no idea whether or not that's the exact amount of commission. I guarantee you that's not the exact amount of commission and we'll show why after we take this quick commercial break. I'm John Christmas, stick with us. You're watching Ask the Instructor. Have you been thinking about starting a career in real estate? Enjoy an entrepreneurial lifestyle that allows for schedule flexibility with unlimited income potential. In real estate, the sky is the limit and what you put in is what you get out. Learn more about a career in real estate at tampaschool.com. Did you know that if post-licensing education isn't completed by your first renewal, your real estate license will become null and void? If your license becomes null and void, you must restart the licensing process all over again. At the Tampa School of Real Estate, we make renewal requirements easy. Visit postflorida.com to learn more and enroll today. Do you want to incorporate studying for your real estate exams into your busy schedule? Now you can review the key topics you need to know to pass your class and state exams with our MP3 audio review. Simply pop in your headphones or connect to your car to reinforce crucial information while you exercise or drive. Listen to the first unit for free at mp3audioreview.com. That's mp3audioreview.com. Does your current career allow for unlimited income potential? With a career in real estate, the sky is the limit. What you put in is what you get out. Find out more about how you can tap into the unlimited income potential of a career in real estate at tampaschool.com. Hey, 
Hey, if you're enjoying the show today, which I'm sure you are, be sure to hit like, subscribe, post your comments, share with your friends and family. Thank you guys so much for watching. You are watching Ask the Instructor. After every Wednesday at 12 noon Eastern Time, I'm John Carismo. Oh, you're watching Ask the Instructor. Hey, welcome back to this week's episode of Ask the Instructor. Every Wednesday, 12 noon Eastern Time, we come to you live to help you understand technical aspects like what we're talking about today, the technical bits and pieces of a listing appointment. So that way you're able to go into your listing appointments confident and prepared and ready to get that listing signed. So that way you now have some inventory to help get you buyers, to get you more sellers, to get you referrals, to, to get your business pumping and rocking and rolling and ultimately have some success in the real estate industry. So that's what we do uh, every Wednesday, 12 noon Eastern time, as well as every Friday, 12 noon Eastern time. Wednesdays, it's Ask the Instructor, more technical stuff. Fridays, we've got State of real estate kind of talking about the mastermind and what to kind of look at maybe the higher level type of stuff not so much the math we really don't use the whiteboard uh, at all on Fridays but both those shows you should be tuned into make sure you subscribe go to tampaschool.com forward slash success to put your email in there you'll get email notifications you can hop over on YouTube just search for Tampa School of Real Estate we've got over 80,000 views on our channel so make sure you subscribe on there or good old Facebook as well share it with your friends and family and make sure you like the page but what we're talking about, the final little bit and piece of today's episode is based on what is our commission when the seller says they want to net $100,000. These are the same numbers from that last scenario. I just rewrote them while we're on the break here. Uh, so we've got a nice little cleaner way to look at this here. So the seller wants to net $100,000. The closing costs are $10,000. The loan payoff is $150,000 what would be our commission? How can we figure out what the commission cost would be in this here? And this is the math you wanna be able to master, especially if you're doing these calculations on the fly, especially on the listing appointment, because the last thing you want is looking like you don't know how to do math. If it looks like you don't know how to work with numbers here, that's gonna kill your credibility just like that. So you don't want that. This is a really easy calculation when you know what to do. And ultimately what we have to do is combine these costs. So we're gonna combine those costs, the $150,000 loan payoff, the $10,000 in closing cost, and the $100,000 in seller's net, and that means we've got $260,000 before we have commission. Now let's say we're wanting to charge a 6% commission on this pro property. 6% isn't based on this, on this amount. It's not based on the seller's net, it's not based on the closing cost, it's not based off of the payoff, it's based on the sale price. So ultimately, We've got this 260,000, which represents our expenses. We've got to add to that our commission. And that's going to give us our sale price. So we've got our expenses, we have to add our commission, and that's gonna give us our sale price. The problem is, we don't know what either of these two numbers are. We don't know what that sale price is gonna be because we need the sale price in order to figure out the commission, and we don't know what the commission is because we need the sale price to figure that out. So now, how do we do the math? You have to think of this in terms of percentages. So when we look at this in terms of percentages, our, expense, our commission, if we wanna charge a 6% commission, then that commission is 6%. And it's 6% of what? It's 6% of the sale price. So the sale price, that's our reference point. That's our 100%. And now if we just carry this math across, 6% is the commission, the sale price is 100%. When we add the expenses to the commission, we end up with 100%. 100% minus 6% gives us 94%. So these expenses are equivalent to 94%. If we're charging 7% commission, the expenses are 93%. If we're charging 5% commission, the expenses are 95%. Charging 8% commission, expenses are 92%. You see how that math works. When you find out all the expenses other than the commission, you can now assign a percentage to that that's gonna be 100% minus whatever commission it is that you're charging. Now the math becomes very easy because normally what we're doing is Sale price times 6% gives us our commission. We're gonna go in reverse. We're going in reverse and we're gonna have to flip this around. So what we're gonna do basically is take this 260,000 and divide it by 94%. So you take the cost of all the expenses except for the commission, divide that by whatever this percentage is when we take out the commission, 
and that's going to give us what price we need to sell the property for. So when we punch that into our handy dandy calculator, we do 260,000 divided by 0.94 you've got $276,595. That's what we need to sell this property for minimum price. And you can see how my estimate that I came up with earlier, the $280,000, that was a little bit high. We could sell this for just under a little bit, uh, about $4,000 less and still be able to hit that $100,000 seller's net. And ultimately, the lower we drop this, the less the commission is going to be because that's the percentage of this sale price here. And say, if we did want to find out what the commission is, all we've got to do is just subtract out that $260,000. And it's not a $20,000 commission. Like I said, I knew that number was close, but it wasn't exact. It is... $16,595 and about 74 cents. So that would be our commission. And now that we've got the more accurate number, and the more you work with numbers like this, the closer you're able to get with that. You'll be able to come up within a couple thousand dollars of the commission just by looking at what those numbers are. But ultimately, the math will never lie to you as long as you're doing it correct. And that's why this show every Wednesday is so important. So again, make sure you subscribe. Go to facebook.com forward slash Tampa School, youtube.com. Probably easiest just to search Tampa School of Real Estate because their little URLs aren't really that helpful. Um, or just go to tampaschool.com forward slash success, pop in your email. Not only will you be able to rewatch this episode, so if you've gone through this here and you're like, John, you just get so fast sometimes, and I know that. That's because I get excited about real estate. I know this stuff like the back of my hand, and sometimes it's just a little bit too quick, but that's the beauty of YouTube. There's that little gear icon. You click on that, and you could slow me down to where I'm talking like this, and now it's a lot slower, or you could just pause me. So on demand, you could watch this episode as well as all the previous episodes, uh, tampaschool.com forward slash success. That's two C's, two S's, and you'll be able to get in there and see all those previous episodes that we've done. Make sure you subscribe, make sure you like it, make sure you share it with your friends. I really appreciate you guys tuning in and watching. And if you guys are looking to start or enhance your real estate career, check us out at tampaschool.com. Give us a call at 813-928-0106, or check out our recommended strategy to pass your exams on the first try at passfirsttry.com. You've seen those all across the bottom of the video. Make sure you check those out because we've got a lot of helpful tools to help you either start your career, jumpstart your career. We've got the post-licensing deadline coming up at the end of September. It still may seem like it's early, but if you're going to be doing this online, yes, it's on demand. You can complete it pretty quickly, but make sure you set aside the time to do that. So check that out uh, on the website, tampaschool.com. Better yet, give us a call. We can help you out. Our advisors are standing by to answer any questions you have and assist you in any way that you can. Again, thanks for tuning in today, and I will see you for next week's episode of Ask the Instructor. Have you been thinking about starting a career in real estate? Enjoy an entrepreneurial lifestyle that allows for schedule flexibility with unlimited income potential. In real estate, the sky is the limit, and what you put in is what you get out. Learn more about a career in real estate at tampaschool.com. Did you know that if post-licensing education isn't completed by your first renewal, your real estate license will become null and void? If your license becomes null and void, you must restart the licensing process all over again. At the Tampa School of Real Estate, we make renewal requirements easy. Visit postflorida.com to learn more and enroll today. Do you want to incorporate studying for your real estate exams into your busy schedule? Now you can review the key topics you need to know to pass your class and state exams with our MP3 audio review. Simply pop in your headphones or connect to your car to reinforce crucial information while you exercise or drive. Listen to the first unit for free at mp3audioreview.com. That's mp3audioreview.com. Does your current career allow for unlimited income potential? With a career in real estate, the sky is the limit. What you put in is what you get out. Find out more about how you can tap into the unlimited income potential of a career in real estate at tampaschool.com. Hey, if you're enjoying the show today, which I'm sure you are, be sure to hit like, subscribe, post your comments, share with your friends and family. Thank you guys so much for watching. You are watching Ask the Instructor. After every Wednesday at 12 noon Eastern time.
I'm John Chris Mel. Oh, you're watching Ask the Instructor. Hey.